You can use a piece of apparatus like this to investigate Charles' law. Charles' law is for ideal gases. It tells you how the volume of an ideal gas varies with temperature for a constant pressure. So let's have a look at this apparatus then. What you've got is a capillary tube which is sealed at one end. In this case, it's sealed at the bottom. And at the top, it's open to the air. This happens to be mounted on a board, but it doesn't have to be. There's a thermometer next to it. And right now, the temperature in this room is measuring at approximately 20, maybe 21 degrees. This capillary tube, which is sealed at one end, has a liquid put inside it, but not a lot of liquid. You might just be able to make it out if I get the camera at the right angle. There's a small bubble of liquid here, right there. If I move around, it might make it easier to see. Now that bubble of liquid is there to encapsulate trapped air inside the bottom of this tube. Now, because we want to investigate ideal gases, we need this air that's trapped to behave as much like an ideal gas as possible. So what we do is we make sure that we dry that air out. And one way to dry that air out is to um, use hydrochloric acid, very concentrated hydrochloric acid, as this liquid. And then if there is any water vapour in this column of air, it's going to diffuse into the concentrated hydrochloric acid and, and over time dry this out. It does mean that, of course, there are risks associated with this experiment because you're going to have a little bit of concentrated hydrochloric acid sat here and you don't want it to squirt out the end and of course it's open at the end so you do have to take some precautions when you're doing this practical one of the things we're going to use is a scale down the side which is in centimeters so we need to make sure that the very bottom of this tube which i can see is actually here not here it's sealed at the bottom that needs to line up with a zero otherwise we're going to get a zero error so I'm going to move this whilst viewing from above to reduce parallax error and make sure that the bottom of this tube, when viewed directly from above, is level with zero. Now, there are no mirrors on here to help me reduce parallax error, so I'm just going to do it by eye. And you can see that right now, this column of air is 9.0 centimetres, to the nearest millimetre, 9.0 centimetres long. And that is at 20, let's say that's 21 degrees Celsius. So what we need to do is to adjust the temperature of this column of air. And we're going to do that using a water bath. You might be able to hear the kettle boiling in the background. What we're going to do is put boiling water in here. We've got a beaker of cold water, which we can mix with it to adjust the temperature of the water, and an empty beaker for when we want to give us more space in this water bath. Let's put some boiling water in this beaker. Now I'm wearing goggles because I don't want to have anything splashing in my eyes in case this little bit of hydrochloric acid there rises up and squirts out the end. I'm also pointing this away from me just in case that happens. So let us pour the boiling water in very carefully because I don't want to shatter the beaker. And you might start seeing the column of air moving already. Oh dear, I've evaporated the hydrochloric acid altogether. Okay. You know, sometimes I do an amazing job of demonstrating just how bad I am at chemistry, and this is one of those times. So I've set it all up again. Oh, I've just got another bit of apparatus. You can see there's the liquid here. I'll just put a shadow there so you can see it more clearly. Where the palm of my hand is, you can see that there is a column of liquid there. Um, and then we've got the air trapped at the bottom. This time I'm not going to go for the full boiling water thing. Uh, I need to write down the starting temperature, which this thermometer either is calibrated differently or the room has warmed up a little bit because that's shown 22 degrees Celsius. And the length of this column, making sure the bottom is lined up, it is 8 point, I make that 8.8 .8 centimetres. Okay, so now let's empty some of this boiling water and let's put some cold water in. I'll do that because I need both hands. Okay, this water now is not at boiling temperature. 
Um, it's still hot, but it's not so hot that I can't put my finger in it. Let's see what happens. By the way, that's not a safe way of checking the temperature of water. I just did that because, you know, I like to be nice and safe or maybe not. Um, so the column of air is increasing in volume. I can see that because I can watch as, um, as this capillary meniscus there moves and it moved a little bit moving as much as I wanted it to really, but it moved a little bit. Um, the temperature of the water is showing here at 61 degrees. And I have to lift this out a tiny bit to see what this is, 10.5 centimeters. So that's 60, hmm, 61 degrees, 10.5 centimeters. What I'm going to do is pour out some of the hot water and add some cold water. There's not going to be a huge range of lengths here, but it should be enough. I've tipped out some of the hot water. Let's add some of the cold water. There we go. And let's add this apparatus back. Now, I'm making sure that the amount of gas that's encapsulated doesn't change because I'm using the same apparatus each time. Let's just wait for it to reach some sort of thermal equilibrium. The thermometer there is showing 48 degrees now. So I'll write that down. And the length of the column of air is 10.0 centimeters. So I'll write that down. Okay, let's get rid of some more of this hot water, which is now actually cold enough for me to handle one-handed. Let's add a little bit more of this cold water to further adjust the temperature. Let's pop the Charles Law apparatus back in and let's watch as the temperature drops a little bit further actually uh, because it's been out it's going up slightly. Okay that looks like it's close to 41 degrees, it rounds to 41 degrees Celsius and we have 10.7 no, 9.7, I thought that sounded odd. 9.7 and 41 degrees. So let's write that down. And we're going to do this for a few measurements. I won't show you all of them because otherwise you'll get bored of watching it. But we're going to do this for a few measurements. Tipping away some water, adding some more cold water, and then putting the apparatus back in waiting for the thermometer to stop moving, no, for the, for the value on the thermometer to stop changing, and then recording the temperature as the independent variable and the length of the column of air as the dependent variable. So this is 35 degrees Celsius, and the column of air is 9.4, perhaps, 9.5. So 9.5 to 35. 35, 9.5. So I'm going to skip forward. There we go. We have seven results. They're not in a sensible order because I put the room temperature measurement at the start here, and that really should be in a sensible order, but that doesn't matter. We've got our results. Now we need to think about what we're going to plot before we plot it. Remember, Charles' law is that volume should be proportional to temperature for constant pressure and constant amount of gas. There's nothing wrong with saying amount of gas, but it's best to qualify it by saying either mass of gas or number of molecules of gas or even number of moles of gas. So here, this constant K, the constant of proportionality, is related to the pressure and it's related to the number of molecules or moles or mass of gas, and it depends how we choose to quantify amount. Now, I didn't measure the volume. I measured the length of the column, but the cross-sectional area of the interior of the capillary, well, that's fixed. That was the same the whole time. So I could say that the volume is equal to this fixed area multiplied by the length of the capillary. Now, I also didn't measure a Kelvin temperature. This is an absolute temperature. What I measured was a Celsius temperature. And I can say that that is equal to uh, the Celsius, sorry, Kelvin temperature is equal to the Celsius temperature plus some amount, some number, which is the Kelvin temperature equivalent to zero degrees Celsius. So I'm going to go ahead and call this um, TF. 
okay? And I'm just, I'm just, I had to pick a letter. I'm just calling it TF. It doesn't matter. So that is the Kelvin temperature, um, the uh, highest temperature that frozen water can be, at atmospheric pressure, okay? So that, that's, that's roughly what that is. So now I've got my theta, which is my temperature measured in degrees Celsius, which is what this is. I should probably change that because we... Uh, we didn't measure a Kelvin temperature. We use a capital T usually to indicate Kelvin temperature. So let's call that theta. Um, and the rest of this, are all, uh, this equation are all constants. So L and theta are our variables. Now we need to get this equation in the form y equals mx plus c, a straight line graph. Uh, so what we're going to do, I'm going to put L, which was the dependent variable, I'm going to divide through by A, just like that. But then it's still not in the form y equals mx plus c. So if I multiply this bracket out, I end up with L equals k over a theta plus k over a t subscript f. Now that is in the form y equals mx plus c. If I plot that on the y-axis and I plot that on the x-axis, then that's going to become my gradient and that is going to become my y-intercept. I can measure the gradient from my graph of L versus theta and then use that gradient and my measurement of my intercept to determine what Tf should be. And what I'm hoping is, from these results, that's going to be about 273 degrees Celsius. Well, let's find out. The two most important items in your physics practical exam arsenal are a well-sharpened pencil. I'm using a blunter one so that the lines are darker so it's easier to see on the video. You should use a well-sharpened pencil and a 30 centimeter clear plastic ruler. Not a 15 centimeter clear plastic ruler, it just won't be long enough. Not two 15 centimeter clear plastic rulers connected with a hinge. It must be a 30 centimeter clear plastic ruler. Things to consider when drawing your scales. False origins are good. This is how you indicate a false origin. You include the numbers. No zigzaggy lines. That's wrong. You're going to want to make sure that you occupy at least half the space horizontally and vertically with data points. So if you look at my table of data, my range of temperatures was from 22 degrees Celsius to 61 degrees Celsius. So I figure if I go from 20 to, well, 65, 61, 60, about that, that's going to be more than half the space then vertically, my range of numbers is going to be from 8.8 .8 to 10.5. So I've gone from 8.5 to 10.5. One thing to bear in mind, the precision of the number you write down on the axes should match the precision of the number in the table. Let's plot those points. OK, I've plotted my points. And you look at this point here, it does look a bit out of place. That was the room temperature point. Now, it may be that when I added the boiling water, something happened. Maybe some of the um, hydrochloric acid evaporated into the gas, changing the volume, uh, changing the mass of gas that I was experimenting with. I don't know, but this point looks suspicious to me, so I'm tempted to leave that out. Now, taking repeats on a practical like this of each of these data points is going to be impossible because there's no way I'm going to be able to get the water to exactly these temperatures again in order to make those repeats. So I'm not going to be able to do that. And that means that there's no sensible reason for me to put error bars on this graph. I might use error bars if I've got a range of possible values that a single data point could take, but I don't have that. Using my 30 centimetre clear plastic ruler, I can see that all these points look like they are really along that straight line. But this point here, definitely not. So I'm going to discard that point and I'm going to indicate that on the graph. OK, that's what I think the line of best fit should be. Now, I can easily compute what the gradient is, but be careful. This is not the y-intercept. So let's first of all compute the gradient. I've recorded the numbers and this one I just approximated. I recorded the numbers as coordinates, and I picked points along the line that were not where my x's are. That shows the examiner that I'm not mistakenly using data points that I measured during the experiment. We, we've used them to make the line, now we're going to use the line. Now I need to compute the gradient. You must write that gradient calculation down, that is essential. 
And don't forget gradients have units. This is centimeters per degree Celsius. So make sure you include that unit. That's very important. Now I can use the equation y equals mx plus c, the equation for a straight line, and this gradient, and some point on this graph, maybe I'll use this point because I've already got the numbers for that, I can use that to determine what the y-intercept is. I'll do that now. You write down all of your steps. So I write down y equals mx plus c, so the examiner knows that I know I'm using a straight line, rearranged it to get c as the subject, I then chose to substitute the numbers, and then gave my intercept and included the units of that y-intercept. The final stage, if you look at the equation, now I know the y-intercept, is to compute what T, F, the temperature in Kelvin that's equivalent to zero degrees Celsius, is. When I did my calculation with my results, I got 270... Oh, made a mistake here, haven't I? That shouldn't be degrees Celsius. There we go. 207 Kelvin. Um, OK, it's not quite as high as it should be, and I haven't been able to do any sensible error analysis on this. Uh, what I could have done, of course, is got the uncertainty in my gradient. And I could have done that by taking another line of best fit, which matches most of the points, but isn't the best line of best fit. These four points here, for example, look like they lie along a straight line, but it's a, a shallower straight line. That gives me a line of best fit, but it's certainly not the best line of best fit, but it fits the majority of the points. You can see that that gradient is going to be lower, but also the y-intercept is going to be higher. So a lower gradient, but a higher y-intercept. So the other way around. A lower gradient at the bottom, a higher y-intercept, will give me a larger value of this. Let's calculate what this is. I haven't bothered to show all the calculations because I did it before. This is the gradient, this is the y-intercept. Now that gives me an uncertainty in my y-intercept, so it's the difference between these two is the uncertainty, and it gives me an uncertainty in the gradients. It's the difference between these two, which is the uncertainty in my gradients. So using the numbers from before, the difference in gradients was this. That gives me a percentage uncertainty of 8.9%. So that was that difference divided by that best gradient, and then times 100%. I did the same thing for the uncertainty in the, uh, in the intercept. So this is the difference between the worst and best intercept, and this is the percentage uncertainty. And the percentage uncertainty in TF, which is those two quantities divided, is going to be the sum of those two percentage uncertainties, giving me about 10%. So the question is, is that within 10% of what it should be? And the answer is no. No, it's not. No, it's not. The results went wrong somewhere. I'm not sure where. We could go into detail about where the biggest error was. It looks like it was uh, the gradient that was potentially the biggest source of error. Why is that? Well, then we can look at this and say which of these was the least accurately measured quantity. Um, and we could, we could go into further analysis about why this is. The highest that this could be within our experimental um, uncertainty is 228 Kelvin. And it should be more like 273 Kelvin. Then again, our range of results was quite small. The range of temperatures was quite small. So maybe we shouldn't expect anything more accurate than that. We could do the experiment again and again and again. And the more data we gather, the more accurate we will have our temperature in Kelvin that's equivalent to zero degrees Celsius. But we still have a straight line, near enough, and we still used our Charles law in our investigation.